I'll take that as a yes. Hello, crypto miners. Hello, Y Finance. My name is Mary. Are we ready to go? I certainly am. Thank you so much for having me on, Mary. Great. Hi, and you must be Mr. Stephen. Yes, I'm Stephen. Hi, Stephen. Nice to meet you. Lovely to meet you as well. All right. Yeah, we have uh, two minutes past now, the time. So we can. Mm -hmm. I think we can start, right? Yeah, whereabouts are you based? Uh, I'm in Sweden. Where are you? I'm in Australia, opposite oh, ends of the world. Oh, the opposite side of the world. <laughs> You're down, down under and I'm up above. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> We're at two o'clock in the morning at the moment. Oh, my God. So forgive me if I'm a little tired. Uh, I will. I will try to forgive you. No worries. Uh, so good day, Stephen. Good day, mate. <laughs> <laughs> nice to have you on. Uh, let's talk about you first. So who's Mr. Stephen and... Uh, how long have you been into crypto? <clears throat> Absolutely. Uh, so I've been into crypto since 2016. It was sort of when I st first started my foray. Um, <clears throat> my background prior to entering into the crypto markets was a hedge fund trader and stockbroker. Um, without going into too much details, I focused primarily on bonds. So I was looking at fixed interest markets. Um, from there, I, 2016, I started trading crypto heavily, uh, 2021 was when I decided to take up crypto full time. It was sort of 2020 into 2021. Um, and I guess I've been building Wi-Fi ever since. So <laughs> it's kind of been three years, um, since I've, it's been three years since I started working on this project really. Nice. So you are the founder and developer as well. Uh, yes, I'm one of the founders and I'm not uh, one of the developers. We're developing on Cardano, which requires Haskell, and I am not a Haskell engineer. So I am not one of the developers directly, but I certainly have some, some experience, yes. So, so how many uh, core team members or, or uh, co-founders? Core team members, co-founders, there are six of us in total. Okay. And in total, working on the project, uh, sort of 11 to 13, depending on if we need some assistant engineers to come in at any given point in time. Okay, nice. So do you know each other in real life as well? Are you everyone from Down Under? or? Uh, yeah, so me, myself, uh, Dylan and Dean, we're all from Melbourne. In fact, uh, Dean and I met at a previous um, workplace together. And we left the workplace together to begin this project. And Dylan is uh, Dylan, and I have known each other since we were in high school. Um, so we were sort of a core team that began this project together, alongside with our American, uh, who we actually hadn't met in person at the time. Uh, but subsequently, now we have three in America, three sorry, four in America. Three in Australia. Wow, that makes seven. I guess we're seven core team members. My mistake. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget the core team. Members. Yeah. Um, okay. We forgive you. It's two a.m. But in the we've though. we've all met. We've all met. Um, we've been to conferences together, and uh, we also did a road trip uh, for four days between Las Vegas and Denver together last year, which was very good fun. Nice. Yeah, I, I like to to know that the team know each other. Then. <laughs> In my, yeah. in my mind, it feels more secure and like the team, yeah. You know it's it's important, you're, you're it's important to have, yeah, it's, we're doxed and it's important to have a personal relationship with the team. You know, we're on, yeah. top of, on top of being colleagues, I think at this point, we're also friends. I mean, we've been working full-time plus plus together now for many years trying to put something together, you know, and um, yeah, exactly. it builds relationships. Indeed. Great, great to know. And you said you started like... Three years ago with this project. Yeah, that was when I first started sort of conceiving this project. So it came together sort of 2018, 2019. I began um, privately managing some funds on behalf of friends and family uh, and myself, of course, uh, in DeFi. This endeavor went fairly well. Uh, we were able to take advantage of the 2020 uh, into 2021 DeFi summer. And that was sort of like the forerunner to the bull market. So prior to the bull market starting, DeFi kind of went bananas. And I was right there in the thick of it. Um, but from using all of these DeFi platforms, I started noticing a lot of issues that a lot of them had. 
Um, a, a lot of problems from both their core design, um, tokenomics, uh, d just a lot of issues that I was noticing, as well as in the use of auto harvesters, which I'm also a regular user of. So having noticed these issues as I was um, using, as I was playing with these platforms, I decided to sort of design my own system that solved these problems as I saw them. <laughs> so the problems that I'm talking about principally are the inflationary design of decentralized exchange tokens and the way that they just mint an increasing supply so that they can support an ever, in inverted commas, increasing liquidity. Uh, and another major issue that I noticed is, of course, usability and, and the capacity for users to be able to engage with these DeFi platforms is often very difficult. Yeah, and, and which ones do you talk about then? Well, I don't, I don't generally like giving specific names. Okay. Just, okay. just because as, as a member in the field, I don't want people to misconstrue that as me speaking negatively about another business. Yeah, my bad. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. I'm that's just fine. Curious. That's fine. <laughs> um, but I name. guess I can, I can describe it in, in broader strokes, right? Uh -huh. So in terms of inf the inflationary design of DEX tokens, I think I'm pretty comfortable to say that that is fairly universal across the board. Um, DEXs such as PancakeSwap, uh, on Cardano, you'd have MinSwap, uh, Wing Riders, they're the two major ones that we have at the moment. Uh, Uniswap, uh, God, the list, I, now all of a sudden they all leave me, but the list does very much go on. Circle, uh, sorry, not Circle. Oh yeah, it is Circle. Yeah, those you mentioned are the, I, I guess, the biggest one. And yeah, the, the, there's so many. There's like using. four Polygon DEXs. You know, there's so many DEXs mm -hmm. nowadays. I've used 20 or so I farmed on in my time, and only two of them have turned out to be rugs, so I've been lucky. Um, but it's a jungle, <laughs> it's a jungle it's a out jungle. there. Uh, and then, and then because I just got done in anyway, that's another story. So, what uh, <laughs> what I noticed is that all these to all these dexes have an inflationary token, right? They're essentially minting out more and more token, and they don't have any sustainable system underpinning this that allows for long term sustainable farming to maintain liquidity on their decks. It's very much a short to medium term site rather than a long term um, design, right? Yeah. So what we've built is we've built a system called the bar, which is actually an interpretation of the sushi bar. Um, so sushi were the ones that did the initial design of that and the sushi bar is live. But we're taking the idea of a sushi bar and we're expanding it out to more of our ecosystem than just the fees on our decks, right? So the way that the bar works is users deposit their Wi-Fi uh, Wi-Fi is staked, and we take 0.1% of every trade that takes place on our DEX, and we convert it to Wi-Fi, so we essentially use it to buy Wi-Fi back from the market, and then we distribute that Wi-Fi to everyone who's staked at the bar. Now, we've also expanded into this as we have an NFT, and we're also giving 50% of the royalties of our NFTs will be used to purchase Wi-Fi and deliver it back to the bar. And we also have our um, lottery, and 10% of the lottery every week will be going to the bar. That's upon launch. And as our ecosystem grows, we're going to be feeding more and more systems into our bar mechanism, right? So this will essentially create a cycle where we're perpetually buying back Wi-Fi from the market. Now, another way that we sort of merged, that I sort of tried to merge this design was by increasing the scope of what's called emissions rates. Now, I'm not sure how much experience the audience has in DeFi, and I've already probably been speaking very technically, so I do apologize. If you want me to explain anything that I say, please just let me know. Um, when, we, when we talk about an emissions rate, we're talking about the speed at which tokens are being released to users of the platform. And that doesn't have to be a DEX. That can be any platform doing anything in crypto. Um, so... so can I just ask, when Please. you are talking now, it's like uh, the tokens, they, they just multiply. It's not a fixed, um, what is it called, sum of tokens from so the beginning. There is a fixed maximum value that we can achieve. And the target okay. is to achieve the release of this maximum value over the course of 21 years. Right? So okay. we've got a very so a long bit like Bitcoin. schedule. Yeah, exactly. Right? We have a very long schedule. The maximum supply is 450 million tokens, so a bit more than Bitcoin because we have to sustain a DEX. Um, but the annual, but the you know annual release rate 
of our tokens, as an example, is less than one um, is less than one tenth of pancake swap, right? Mm -hmm. So the rate at which we're emitting emitting our tokens is a lot lower, and we're merging that with a buyback with an inbuilt buyback mechanism that's constructed into every transaction that takes place on our system. Right? I guess that's the easiest way to describe it. So the idea being that if we reduce the total supply, reduce the total rate at which tokens are being released, right, and then we also merge that with a buyback in the mechanism, we're able to implement structural solutions to inflationary token design on DEXs. Right, and that's what we've implemented. Um, I should add, our, our DEX should be launched early to mid-May. So this is all going to be launched in the course of two to two to two and a half weeks. So you have been working for so many years now, and now is the final launch date. But now is the, the final token date. is out there already, or not? Mm -hmm. Yes, the token has been launched. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. The tokens <clears throat> we were actually the fourth ever token minted on the Cardano blockchain. <laughs> <laughs> So that gives you an idea for how long we've been in this ecosystem for. Um, so why did you choose Cardano? There's, there's, a, there's a lot of reasons to choose Cardano. Uh, let's go with the first and I think, you know, it, it is an important one from a business perspective, right? When you're building a DEX, and we're also building an auto harvester after this DEX, which we'll go into later. Um, but when we're building a DEX and you're opening up in an ecosystem, um, particularly one like, let's say, Ethereum or Binance, you've already got, I guess you'd say, institutionalized, in inverted commas, they're not quite institutions, but you have institutionalized competition. So if I go to Ethereum, I mean, Ethereum's going to be very difficult to launch a new DEX on, right? You're competing against yeah. Uniswap, you're competing against SushiSwap, you're competing against... Um, all the big boys. So you want to be the, the Uniswap or PancakeSwap of... That's exactly it, Cardano. right? We yeah. want to be able to stand out in a community where there is um, more space for us to grow. Secondly, uh, I am... My background is a technical background, so I studied physics at university. And from there, I was a quant trader, right? And whilst I'm not a Haskell engineer... There are a lot of advantages to um, there are a lot of advantages to the design of Haskell as a programming language, and particularly in its implementation of smart contracts, which give um, added benefits to security, um, higher levels of mathematical validation, um, and also higher levels of of requirements to meet prerequisites. I guess is the best way to describe it easily, right? So prerequisites have to be met before functions can be executed in a much more mathematically concise way. Um, so this, to me, as with my mathematical background I, and, you know, my experience of having been, having experienced a few rug pulls myself in the past, um, gives me more confidence in it from a structural perspective um, as well. So there's, they're the two major reasons. And I think... There's also to include in that, I should also add that I have also been a fan of Cardano since I first started in cryptocurrency. So ever since I saw Charles, um, Charles Hoskinson's uh, Blackboard, um, you know, I've, I've, uh, I don't want to call myself a convert. I'm very, I'm consider myself chain agnostic, but let's just say that I've been, you know, supportive of Cardano for a long time. All right. Yeah. Fair enough then. Great answer to that question, anyway. So uh, you are mentioning this auto harvester so many mm -hmm. times now. So I want to know what that is because I don't, I don't know really. Yeah. Um, so an auto harvester is, I guess the the clo the analog that you'd use for it on the Ethereum blockchain is a liquidity aggregator. Uh, essentially, users that don't have much experience with engaging with DeFi and the blockchain can find it very difficult to engage with these systems, right? And I don't think that's much of a crazy thing to say. They are complex, no. right? Yeah. <laughs> now, as a user is engaging with these systems, they might find themselves confused or find that it's difficult to be able to actively manage their current portfolio or actively keep track of what it is exactly that each of their tokens they're holding are doing. 
And particularly if you start degening very quickly on DEXs, you'll find that you're holding 15 liquidity pool tokens. You're in 15 different farms, maybe across four different DEXs, and you have no idea what's going on. <laughs> Keep a spreadsheet is my only advice. Now, what an auto harvester does is essentially automate this process for the user. So there's a strategy that the user can invest in, and then that strategy is automatically implemented by the auto harvester. So you can kind of think of it like an indexed fund, but for DeFi, where an index fund would say you would buy a, um, health, port, a health index fund that follows the health industry, and then that has a portfolio that tracks a bundle of health stocks, right? Yeah, so it's, but a, this, it's a help. It's, it's pretty much like you said in the beginning, you're, you're helping friends and family. Mm -hmm. That's exactly it. And that's actually where the entire idea came from. Um, I wanted to take the system that I was implementing for my friends and families, and I wanted to put it onto the blockchain and decentralize it so that users could just press a button and engage, and then that entire system was managed for. Right? So is so, it like a bot? Or? So it, it depends. It, there's actually multiple stages to it. Initially, it won't be a bot. Initially, it's set strategies. And they may be user-created strategies, but they are strategies that don't change. So they would be, for example, 20% Cardano, 20% Bitcoin, 20% Ethereum, 20% um, Sol, and 20% Avalanche. That would be an example of like a five-way strategy, right? <laughs> um, now, when we're dealing, though, with the next stage of our auto harvester, we actually want to implement it with a neural net. Now... The neural net is why we're working with Propeller AI, which is actually a AI consultancy that is run by my father. And they are uh, their, I should add, their geomatics consultancy. So they currently do property market, uh, use neural nets to assist with property market decisions, whether that be uh, placement of franchises, whether that be uh, decisions on where to build new housing estates, whatever it is you need to do within the property market, they will have an AI model that will assist you in making that decision. Um, so we're essentially, uh, using them to build a neural net to incorporate an automated decision-making model to decide on optimized liquidity mining. So optimized liquidity provisions across DEXs. Uh, this full system will take probably around two years. I'd say it's going to be about as long as it took us to build this stage, which has been two years of building. Uh, before we have the full neural net released, as I'm sure you can imagine, incorporating high-end AI with um, decentralized liquidity mining requires a bit of research. Yeah, lots of work. Still. Yeah, we've already done a lot, and we're halfway. We're halfway. Yes. Not that I'm keeping yeah. track or anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it must feel good to, to finally reach one milestone then to, to launch the... The decks. Oh, it feels great. It feels so good. And we've got a lot of implementations on our decks, which is really focused on making the experience easier for the user. Um, so let's start with I, what I'm most proud of. Uh, we're going to be implementing the first uh, stakeless LP farming in all of crypto. So what this means is that a user that comes onto our decks is going to be able to provide liquidity to our DEX, receive the liquidity pool token, which is the token that represents your ownership of a liquidity pool that you've just provided to. And then that liquidity pool just sits in the user's wallet and automatically earns farm. All they have to do is go to our farming dashboard and they'll see that it's automatically earning farm. So that reduces the current user flow Right? So if a user currently wants to engage in a farm, they have to collect uh, two tokens, supply it to liquidity, get the liquidity pool token, approve the farm that they're interested in farming in, and then send that token to the liquidity farm uh, so that it can begin farming. So it's a three-step process currently. We're reducing that entire process down to one single step, supply liquidity. Once your liquidity has been supplied, you're automatically farming and you're already ready to go. So that is something that we're calling one transaction to farm. And we're super excited about it because it's the first time that any DEX in crypto is going to be able to allow users to go from tokens in their wallet to farming in a single transaction. Well, that sounds like 
lots of good help that people would need. I mean, who has time to sit and check everything themselves all the time that, and learn absolutely. everything themselves? <laughs> and I'm sure, and I'm sure any new user that's engaged with a Dex um, and in in DeFi generally, uh, and I've taught a lot of people and helped them engage. You always have the issue. You've helped someone. You've taught them how to do everything, and then you come back a week a week or two later, and you sit down and like, oh, let's have a look at how your farms are going. Then you open up the page, you scroll down, and then you look, and they haven't earned anything. And you're like, wait, why haven't you earned anything? And then you click through, and then you realize, oh, we forgot to deposit the LP tokens into the farm. <laughs> <laughs> and this is, yeah. this is, you know, it happens, honestly, almost 20% of users on the first time they engage in a DEX. It's happened to me when I was first learning. It happens to almost everyone. Another advantage of this system is that no user will ever miss farm. Right. As soon as you've put liquidity into the liquidity pool, you're getting that farm. Hmm. Right. And the way that farming is distributed at the moment is that, let's say, a farm receives 100 Cardano a day. 100. Sorry, I'm used to using Cardano. Let's use Ethereum as an example. Let's say one. Let's say one farm is receiving one Ethereum a day. That one Ethereum is being split between everyone that has supplied liquidity to that farm. Right. Or everyone that's deposited their LP tokens, I should say, sorry, to that farm. So that means the 20 percent that aren't earning that farm. It means that those other people that have actually deposited are earning a higher rate individually. The people that are engaging are generally those that understand the system better, which means you've actually got this situation where new users are giving up their earnings to users that are more experienced because they don't know how to properly engage with the system yet. So those more experienced users get to have the advantage of getting lower in permanence risk on their holdings because the liquidity pool is larger, but they don't have to give up their, uh, their farm because the new users aren't aware of how to engage. So we want to bridge that gap and ensure that everyone who's engaging is receiving their fair share of rewards rather than having users that are more experienced getting an advantage over those that are less experienced, you know, which is something that I think should be an aim for anyone in DeFi. Yeah, I like that. I need, I need you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> there is um, something called Why Learn, right? Yeah, so we're releasing a, and that's going to be, oh, excuse me, I'm just going to drink some water. One yeah, second. That. So that's going to be down the line. Um, fairly, uh, we're hoping to release it this year. We want to release a learning management system to assist users with the actual strategies that underpin DeFi. So my background as a trader uh, provides me with a unique insight into how these systems work from a trading perspective. Um, impermanence risk, which is what users mostly deal with when they're engaged with a liquidity pool, is very much a tool Right. People think of it as something a lot of users that engage with liquidity in general are scared of impermanent risk and are scared of hearing these stories of, you know, tokens have gone down. People have lost heaps of money in liquidity provisions, which can happen. I don't want to say that yeah, doesn't happen because sure. it can. <laughs> but when you look at it from an institutional perspective, all, an, all a liquidity pool is and all impermanent risk is, is a hedge. Right. I have let's say 100% um, uh, shit coin. I'm trying to think of a terrible coin, but I don't want to say any names. So let's just call it S coin. I have 100 S coin, right? If I hold 100 S coin, my risk is 100 S coin, right? If S coin goes down 50%, I lose 50% of my value. Now, if I put that S coin in a liquidity pool with 100 S coin and 100 ethereum's worth a uh, 100 s coins worth of ethereum right so the equivalent value of ethereum now all of a sudden my portfolio risk has changed from 100 s coin to 50 s coin and 50 percent ethereum now the way that liquidity pools work is that as the value of one changes you actually gain more of the one that you're losing of the one that's losing value sorry so let's say s coin drops 50 percent in the liquidity pool, you're going to have 25% less Ethereum, but 25% more S coin. So what you've done is you've taken what would have been a 50% loss from a 50% drop in price in S coin, and you've turned it into a 25% loss from a 50% drop in price in S coin. 
So they balance right. each other, you mean? So they balance each other. Yes, they work like a seesaw, right? Now, if you hold a portfolio of cryptocurrencies and you hold a lot of outright risk on cryptocurrencies, you can use liquidity pools to build hedging structures to essentially help yourself achieve more of an alpha neutral position. Oh my God, let's say that in English. Um, one second. <laughs> or Swedish. No. <laughs> yeah, or Swedish, that might help. Um, okay, if you have a lot of crypto and you're holding of quite a few different cryptos, right? You can use liquidity pools to essentially build in return for yourself when the market is going down. Right, so if the market drops 50%, your portfolio is only down 25%, plus you've been earning farm in the meantime. So the farm has earned you an extra 4% on your portfolio. Your effective portfolio loss is now 21%. Right, so rather where than. Can I, where can I hand down. in my money for you? To... <laughs> <laughs> so, where. So these, these systems are the systems that we want to be teaching, right? And these are the systems that I want to be getting out. I, I want to be more than just that. I want to honestly be writing a book regarding this. I'm not announcing a book or anything, but that is honestly my intention because these systems become very complex, quite mathematically concise, right? Mm -hmm. But if you understand how to use them correctly, you can build very powerful, complex hedging structures that can give you a fairly consistent return with a much lower rate of risk than holding outright crypto itself, right? So how, how much uh, um, do you need to, to manage these things once they are set up? Like a user can start with $100, honestly. Um, like you don't need much. It, it depends what your it, – it honestly depends what your strategy is. So if we treat this like a financial advisory, uh, a bit of a financial advisory session, right, I would say – are you after low risk, medium risk, or high risk, right? And then based on how what level of risk well, you we want to be engaged crypto, with. So we're obviously all high risk, aren't we? Well, yes, but <laughs> even within that, even within that, we've got we've got degrees, right? Like you've got yeah, okay. degeners that want twelve thousand percent yesterday, and if and they don't see it, yeah, <laughs> then you've got bitcoiners that don't want anything but bitcoin. Like you've got different philosophies within that realm, yeah, right? That's true. So what you want to be doing, as well as providing strategies for each of these philosophies, is you want to be thinking which of these philosophies do you fit under, right? And then based on the philosophy that you fit under, you want to be designing a portfolio that is a structure that you're comfortable with. And I think one of the most important things in trading, and this is just trading advice generally, is trade what you know, right? So if you are a doctor, it makes sense that you trade medicine and health stocks, right? At the same time, that doesn't mean you don't want to get involved with Bitcoin. That doesn't mean you don't want to get involved in other things. But if you're going to be actively trading something, I would suggest to you trade in health stocks because that's what you know, right? Um, is there, is get there advisors and index funds to look after your crypto. <laughs> is there like a candy <laughs> or chocolate token that I can trade? Uh, well, there's definitely Cadbury. I mean, I can, <laughs> I can throw you a bunch of confectionery stocks <laughs> if you want to trade confectionery. <laughs> Is your background in um? Is your background in chocolate? No, no, I just like it. <laughs> it is pretty good. <laughs> no, so, sorry, I'm joking. No, 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 that's fine. <laughs> no, no, that's absolutely fine. Laugh away. Um, I I enjoy having a conversation as well. Please, this is this is because this is all very complex stuff, right? And it is. I, I guess what I'm trying to say simply. Very yeah, thank you. I guess what I'm trying to say as simply as possible is. Understanding how complex this can become, I want to build a system that helps users learn what this actually means and how this can be integrated successfully into a portfolio, right? And that's a step-by-step -step structure. Before you learn how to engage with liquidity pools, you need to have a certain basic understanding of crypto, right? And before you engage with crypto, you need to have a certain basic understanding of trading, and before you engage with trading, you need to have a certain basic understanding of macro, macro and microeconomics, right? So it's, it's not just a simple process. And this is something I've definitely found trying to teach people how to engage with these systems. It's not a simple process of just sitting down and saying, hey, have a look at this DEX. If you press five buttons, now you're farming liquidity. Super easy, right? Like, yeah, even if actively it's only a single button to get to your farm, there's still 
logical steps of information that someone needs to conceptually understand before they're able to actively engage. So we want to build a system that essentially builds and bridges that conceptual understanding for users that don't or haven't quite earned that conceptual understanding yet. Right. So are you a financial advisor then? In the past. In the past, yeah. I mean, we, look, financial advisor. Financial in, here, really, but I, if you are, I will. I will add. I will add. I will actually, honestly, add to that. Anything I do say is general in nature. Please do consider your personal financial circumstances before taking, uh, before taking action on anything that I say. Anything that I say um, can and will likely lose you money. So, <laughs> just I do want to add that. Um, but I, I should say that I, I. Look, I got the tickets for financial advisor. It, financial advisor is not a. Uh, I was a stockbroker, you know. Um, I, I I prefer to think of that as uh, just screaming at people on the phone. I don't know if it was really concise yeah, financial spy. advice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> we all say that. <laughs> yeah. So, but I I certainly have experience in the industry. Yes. Yeah. I kind of um, yet. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, um, but my my true my true focus was was bonds, right? Mm -hmm. So it wasn't really stockbroking per se. I was helping people with uh, fixed interest and structured um, structured income products. Mm -hmm. So essentially, like people going into retirement and then being like, okay, we need to work out structured income products for your retirement so that we're able to provide you a consistent income over X number of years. Mm -hmm. All right, but but I, I have now a question about all this uh, uh, ecosystem. Yes, please. And so, is this going to be what is the what what is the vision here now? Because there are lots of things coming, and I I try to read in your roadmap, but that ends last year. So I don't really know what. Oh wait, what? Maybe that's not. I I will definitely yeah. have that updated this week. I do apologize. Um, <laughs> So the the next steps the next steps now. So we're launching our decks on early next month. I really want to announce the launch day, but we get our we get our audit report on the first. Um, and we don't want to announce a launch day until we know that we don't have to make any changes, which is what it seems like at the moment. Um, but you know, it's best to have the report until we formally announce that. Uh, so you know. Early to mid May, uh, we're launching our decks. Once our decks launches, our next step is to build our first phase auto harvester, and this is I'll be writing this up in an article fairly soon as well, uh, which is essentially set strategies on our own platform that users can engage with. So that would be a user goes to a vault, provides Cardano, and that Cardano is automatically sent to six different liquidity pools to farm. Right. Um. Another thing that we're launching, uh, sorry, and then after that, we're essentially going to be working on automating that auto harvester mechanism. So first, we want to make it so that stage two is so that users are able to um, create their own set strategies using our platform, right? Step three is to incorporate other platforms as well, which... That part shouldn't be too difficult. The bit that's more difficult in step three is incorporating um, variable strategies. So that means the strategy can be changed once it's been created. It's no longer just a set strategy that can't be moved. And then once we have the variable strategy vaults, stage four is to incorporate the AI model vaults. So that's to essentially take the variable strategy vaults and have those strategies change variably based on the results of our AI. Mm. Yeah, and my apologies. I found Q1 and Q2 for 23 now. It was just a little bit in a different way that I'm used to read. Oh. So that's, that's all right. We, should, we yeah. should have that fixed so you don't have that mistake. So I'll also look into that. Thank you. <laughs> no, it was my mistake. It is very clear now when I read it. <laughs> but... Uh, Maybe you want to have it uh, longer, though, in, in the... In the yes, so the yeah. it's been in the last sort of three, four months that we've been designing each of these stages for the auto harvester. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, as I said, soon after the launch of our decks, we're going to be releasing an article going through um, each of these stages, step by step, what we believe they entail and what our expected timeframes for each of them are. 
so 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 is this going to be like an um one step solution or one not step one one stop shop one stop yes. shop. yeah that's what i'm after thank you yeah that's for it. cardano for those who want to do things in on the cardano that's absolutely platform. it that's absolutely mm -hmm. it so we've already got um vaults which are essentially we allow other communities to set up staking for their community on our platform we currently have 14 or 15 different projects on our platform that you can stake their tokens or NFTs. Um, we had the first NFT staking on Cardano. We launched that back in October of 2021. We had the first governance on Cardano, which we launched around the same time. We had the first lottery on Cardano. Uh, we're now going to have the first, distributives, um, the first distributive mechanism on Cardano, the bar. And we're going to have the first non-custodial LP staking. We call it stakeless LP farming, just to make it a bit nicer. The, um, the first stakeless LP farming in all of crypto. So we've basically, as, as I said earlier, you know, we've been in this ecosystem for a long time. We've been innovating for a long time. And now we're bringing these innovations to the entire crypto space. And we think that these innovations allow us to build a better, more advanced DEX which is not only easier for users, but also provides more advanced tools for more advanced users. So tell me again about this stakeless LP, LP farming. farming. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the mechanism whereby once a user provides liquidity to our platform and they receive the LP in their token, so that's the liquidity pool token, which represents their ownership of the liquidity pool. Once they receive that, they're automatically farming Wi-Fi. They don't have to do anything else. They don't have to stake it anywhere. They don't have to send that LP token out of their wallet. It stays in their wallet, and they're automatically farming. Okay. Now, what this means, as, as we described earlier, from a user perspective, it's a lot easier, right? No one's missing out on farm. Everyone's um, – it's Everyone super easy for a user. Everyone token gets some benefits. Gets right? their farms, yeah. yeah. But what – what this means from an advanced user perspective, right? Because this now also goes deeper. <laughs> what this means from an advanced user perspective is that these liquidity pool tokens are no longer just dead value that's being sent into a farm and disappears from your wallet and is only being used for that single purpose, which is in that farm, right? These LP tokens now become available value that sit in your wallet and essentially represent, to bring it back to my past life, a bond that's earning Wi-Fi over a period of farm, or a period of time for which the farm is being engaged. That's to bring it back to a classical finance analog. It's not actually a bond. Please do not think of LP, our LP tokens as bonds, right? That's just an analogy. But what this means is that users can now use these LP tokens for other purposes than just pushing it into a farm. An example of this is we can actually play a bit of a game of inception with liquidity pool tokens. And what I mean by that is a user can take a liquidity pool token and they can actually match that with, let's say, Cardano to create what we call a layer two liquidity pool. And this layer two liquidity pool means that from the front end of our DEX, users are able to actually come into the front end of our DEX, go to the swap page, and they can actually directly buy into liquidity pools that have got these layer two liquidity pools. So let's say you're a new user approaching a DEX. You barely understand the concept of what liquidity is, but you know that if you have one of these tokens, you can farm, right? You want to learn. Um, but you want to engage with 100 Cardano and you want to work out how to engage. In the current model, to engage, you have to find the liquidity pool that you want to purchase, that you want to engage with. You have to trade out half of your Cardano for that token so you can have both of those tokens. You have to supply both tokens to the liquidity pool. And then you have to do the farming process that we just described earlier, which is um, go to the farm, approve the farm, send the tokens out of your wallet and put them into the farm. Yeah. Because we and have the capacity now, then no, no. Uh, because we have these layer two liquidity pools, a user can come to our decks and just go it into our swap menu and select liquidity pool for Wi Fi Cardano and then put in 100 Cardano and then press swap, and then they've automatically swapped it and they've received their LP token that's already in their wallet. Mm -hmm. 
And because we've got stakeless farming, as soon as it hits their wallet, they're instantaneously farming. So that means that a new user that wants to engage with liquidity can engage with liquidity without even providing liquidity. They can just swap straight for a liquidity token. Hmm, interesting. And you're and that's the only something, one who, who does this. That's never been done in crypto before. And the reason we've been able to do this, I should add, is because of Cardano's technology. So we're essentially uniquely implementing Cardano's staking mechanism to be able to build a better DEX, right? So staking in Cardano, the way that it works is that you put Cardano into a wallet, <clears throat> any Cardano wallet, you stake that Cardano to a staking pool, and then that Cardano stays in your wallet and you can still move it to any wallet you want, but at the same time, it's staking and earning rewards. Oh, so you can right? move it out from the wallet. Absolutely. And when you move it out from the wallet, you still earn all the rewards up until the point that it was in the wallet. Okay. Right? So these staking rewards, um, this system is built into the Cardano blockchain. That's how the Cardano blockchain is designed. That's one of the, another one of the advantages of the Cardano blockchain. They've got true non-custodial staking, which is what Ethereum aims to release over the course of the next four years. Right? Mm -hmm. Ethereum aims to be there in four years' time. Cardano's had it for almost five years now. So, um, sorry, please. No, I just wanted to... I know, no financial advice, and you don't have a, a super uh, crystal ball or something, but where's your thoughts about... Uh, Cardano and and the future and the the projects are building on on Cardano because it just got released a year ago or a year and a half ago right to be mm -hmm. able to to build or I know some project wants smart there contracts too yeah yeah exactly mm -hmm. that's and that's and that's one of the reasons why as I said we were the first to launch um, NFT staking on Cardano and it was so very hard for the exact reason that you just described. We launched it almost a year before smart contracts were released. <laughs> um, anyway, but, but uh, now they are. So how? how do now you, they are. We are in the bull. We're not in the bull run. Mm -hmm. We're in the bear market now still, and people are looking forward to the next bull run. What's your prediction? What's your well, I don't like to. Saying? I don't like to make predictions in the way yeah, that you're no. saying it. But I'll give you my interpretation. I think is a better yeah. word. Okay. Um. Cardano is in a very unique position in that its technology allows for systems to be implemented in new and original manners, right? For example, the way that we're building our DEX allows users to create layer two liquidity pools, which then allows new users to engage with liquidity by just swapping directly for liquidity pool tokens. Or, the, or could, they could use our liquidity pool tokens as collateral to be provided for loans. So now you can put, provide liquidity to a platform, earn farm on that liquidity, and also use that to take out a loan of, of Cardano, let's say, uh, so that you can use the farm that you're earning from your liquidity to pay back your loan simultaneously whilst you're now doing other things with the loan, right? These tools, due to Cardano's design, become implementable in manners that I believe are easier for the user and soon will be easier for the builder to implement. So I think the space for Cardano to grow is huge because we're going to have one of what I believe is the most advanced DeFi sectors over the course of the next two to four years, right? So if you think, just very quickly, if you think yeah. of DeFi right, as a space, the f Uniswap was launched on Ethereum. Um, let me just make sure I get this correct. I'm just quickly typing it into Google to make sure I don't make a mistake here because that would be embarrassing. And now my Google decides not to work. I believe it was 2015, but it may have been 2016. Yeah, all right. Um, so if you think, oh, wow, it was 2018. I'm so off. Anyway, it was 2018. That's still perfect for my example. So Uniswap launched in 2018. That means one year later, we're in 2019, right? <laughs> that, that was not Google <laughs> needed, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I agree. That, that one I didn't need Google for, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so that means 
the the Cardano blockchain is in the same spot that the Ethereum blockchain was in 2019, right? Mm-hmm. Um, now I th- the other big thing is that the Cardano blockchain is really focusing on real fi, which is essentially real world applications for the blockchain. There's a lot of projects doing housing, a lot of projects doing micro loans is is a very big one that's uh, commonly being implemented. Uh, a lot of projects do like WMT, World Mobile Token, who are doing um, telecom telecommunications lines, and they're starting with Zanzibar, and they're currently laying down communications lines in Zanzibar to give Zanzibar 100% internet coverage. Um, so there's a lot of these real world projects in Cardano, and, and I feel like that's that's kind of the community that Cardano fosters, right? We want to, we are all kind of dreamers that want to change the world in Cardano. I think more so than other blockchains. Um, and taking that into consideration, I think that also gives us a large capacity to effectuate the change that we want to see in the world, right? Mm-hmm. And the more we get to get this message out to people, uh, you know, the more people often, you, you can see that if we're trying to do new things in new ways that makes it easier and better for users and hopefully makes the world a better place, you know, you, you hope that you build it and they will come, I guess, is the greatest uh, quote I can use for that. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. But, but aren't you uh, worried uh, that lots, because there are lots of newcomers coming now and people are uh, building a lot during this bear market or bear phase mm-hmm. um, that can like uh, surpass Cardano blockchain and be an even better, faster, cheaper. In, in terms of other blockchains, on. in terms of yeah. other blockchains, I, every other blockchain is cheaper to build on as a starting point. Um, <laughs> so I just want to put that. I just want to put that out there as a as just a point of fact. Um, to give you an idea, you can hire a, Sol- a Solidity engineer for fifteen USD an hour. You can't find a Haskell engineer for under one hundred and fifty USD an hour. Oh, okay. Okay. So let's let's just put that in comparison for a moment. Building on Cardano is at least 10x more expensive than building on Ethereum, right? Okay. Um, so isn't that like a is that is that good? Is no. that good? No, <laughs> no, that's not good, right? <laughs> but what it does mean, what it does mean, is that you feel, I guess, to a certain degree, a little more secure once you have it built, because mm-hmm. you know that the hurdle to be able to build it is higher, right? Yeah. So there is that from a business perspective, which is an advantage. But these tools are actually being implemented to make this building a lot easier, right? It's not yeah, this. Yeah. Um, it's not. It's not going to be that expensive. It probably isn't already. It's the cost is already coming down, um, but it's definitely not going to be that expensive in two to, in two years' time, right? Mm-hmm. So in terms of other blockchains, one thing that I still stand by is the mathematical advantage of Cardano's model, right? And I guess that's something that Cardano really fosters is like this sort of community of PhD mathematicians, um, IT experts, and all these real sort of eggheads. And I don't like to use that term because I'm a member of the same community. So I guess that makes me an egghead. Um, (laughs) But it's because the mathematical conciseness to Cardano's model is better than other blockchains. It's the best model of all the blockchains, the the extended UTXO model, in my how in my do humble I, opinion. As a user then, or a normal investor, mm, recognize that. What does that mean for for? Well, let's let's uh, as, as a starting point, um, Cardano's got a very clear path to become quantum um, to become quantum unhackable, which means quantum computers can't hack Cardano wallets. Okay. Right. That's not yet implemented, but it's already difficult for Cardano. It's already much more difficult for quantum computers to hack Cardano than it is than it would be other blockchains. So other blockchains, by from its actual core construction, are quantum uh, quantum vulnerable. Right. Ethereum is quantum vulnerable. Um, so as a starting point, that's a huge advantage because quantum computing is coming and that will arrive over the next 10 to 20 years um, and unless blockchains are able to build mechanisms to protect themselves from that then those blockchains are going to die so as a starting point for longevity Cardano has already got that advantage um, and that's an advantage that's one advantage that's delivered through Good mathematical know, yeah. 
conciseness, mm -hmm. right? Um, and another another advantage as as a user um, from a user perspective is that Cardano is the most decentralized model of blockchain. Um, you know, you're able to you're able to hold your tokens whilst you're also able to non custodially stake those tokens and earn an income. Right, that's something that you can't really do on any other non extended UTXO model chains. And I should add, Cardano isn't the only. Um, this is the this model of blockchain. I should add is called EUTXO, which stands for Extended um, Unspent Unspent Transaction Output Model, um, and that's an extension of Bitcoin's UTXO model, which is just the Unspent Transaction Output Model. Um, so these. This extended model, is, and it's something that I guess Cardano heads have been talking about for a long time, but this Cardano model is also implemented on a few other blockchains, um, and it is mathematically more sound. I, I, I'm sounding like a nerd that's repeating himself, right? It's mathematically more sound. <laughs> other nerds like that. <laughs> so as long as nerds I'm exist, to, there will I'm be a space, of us, space for us. <laughs> <laughs> always easy but uh, but you are you are confident that uh, cardano is keeping up with uh, their competitors anyway then uh, uh that uh, cardano is keeping up with its competitors that's an interesting one i think the community is absolutely keeping up with its competitors and we're building and build and bringing out tools that yeah. are new and unique for crypto and i think the space that we're creating is certainly not only competitive, but is going to be one of the strongest um, DeFi and RealFi spaces in crypto. Um, the I generally like to avoid commenting on decisions of business daddy, much like I'm certain people who run programs on Foxtel often don't comment on their thoughts of Fox. Um, <laughs> so we'll... We'll we'll avoid discussions of the business daddy. In all, I say yeah. that Cardano is very much poised, very much poised um, to be at the forefront of the next bull market. You are not regretting that you choose Cardano anyway. That we can say ebbs and flows, but no. <laughs> all right, good. So, are you going to have your own uh, wallet also then? For or which wallet do you? No. Prefer at the moment you engage first. with um, any of the Cardano wallets. So the the users will be used to that don't use Cardano will be used to MetaMask. The equivalent to MetaMask for Cardano is a wallet called Nami N A M I, and Nami wallet and Nami wallet uh, basically is just like MetaMask and lets you engage with Cardano DApps. Um, uh, my favorite wallet is called Eternal E T E R N L, and Eternal is a fantastic wallet. Same thing, um, but you can also have Jiro wallet. Uh, your Roy. There's a lot of Cardano wallets. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Pick your favorite. Once you have a Cardano wallet, you just go to app.vifi.io and you just connect your wallet. And now it's just like any other DAP. Um, whatever Cardano is in that wallet, you can use just like you would anywhere else. Very good. And the DAP is no, not the DAP. The, the Dex is out in what did we say? Did you say it in a? Early to mid May. Early to mid. Early, early to, to mid May. May. Oh, okay. Yes. Not... And would you need? Uh, I mean, to be a holder of the token, uh, do you get any benefits then on the Dex? Well, or... if you're if you're a holder of the token, you can engage with the Dex straight away. So that means you can deposit your Wi-Fi to the bar, uh, to begin earning in the distributive mechanism. You can provide liquidity and begin earning farm. You can already stake Wi-Fi to earn other tokens in Cardano and also to earn more Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. uh, so our token already has a utility on our platform if you go to app.vifi.io. Um, so, I mean, yes, you do have the advantage, of course, of being able to engage uh, in the DEX. <laughs> but you don't need to hold Wi-Fi to engage in the DEX, right? We're going to have, we're launching with upwards of 40 or so different farms, which means that you'll also be able to, for example, uh, provide liquidity in on Cardano. We have a stable coin called Jed. You'd be able to provide um, liquidity to, let's say, Jed IUSD, which is another stable coin on Cardano. So we will also have stable, stable farms, and we will also have farms for different combinations of tokens, right? Okay. So 
you can you can approach with pretty much any Cardano native token that you hold, um, and we'll be accepting most Cardano native tokens. Yes. Good, uh, very good. Is there something else we we should uh, talk? It's very interesting, so maybe we got off tra- track a little bit. I'm and I'm sure I've missed thousands. A lot too, but <laughs> yeah, talking about Cardano, talking a bit about bonds. Um, yeah, look, the, the only thing I want to say is. You know, we have all our socials. We've got Twitter. We've got Discord. Um, our Twitter is here. Please follow us. Uh, we've got our Discord and our Telegram, which are linked on our Twitter. We've also got our Medium, which we just launched an article an hour ago describing how our stakeless LP farming will be working for the users. We've also got a lot of articles on our Medium that go through in more detail the concepts that I sort of brought up today. So the stakeless LP farming, the layer two liquidity pools, um, the bar, uh, the distributive mechanisms and how that'll work. So all of these things that I brought up and touched on, uh, we go into detail on how they actually are functioning. And we're always around to answer any questions you have. You know, don't hesitate if you have any questions about our ecosystem to jump in and ask away. We did notice that a lot of people responded uh, to this tweet, uh, to your tweet, with a bunch of questions. So we will actually be going through and answering some of those questions um, over the next day or so. It is three in the morning, so let me sleep and yeah. then I'll hit start answering. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel for you. <laughs> I don't want to keep you too long. <laughs> no, no, no. Don't feel bad for me. I, I work. I work. I work at this time. I live in Australia. I start work at ten in the morning. I finish work at six in the morning that's that's unfortunately my time zone yeah okay so i see i see some people from uh, the foundation cardano foundation in here i just want to have a a shout out to jeremy i see jeremy is here we have we had them over not too long ago uh to speak about cardano as well so hello jeremy i've I've met jeremy (laughs) a few times um yeah, and if, I, you might leave to come and say something if you want to, but maybe he's busy. Yeah, yeah, know. please bring him up if you'd like to come up. Um, yeah, so I, I've met him at a few different conferences. Jeremy's a great man. Thank you for all the hard work you do for Cardano, Jeremy. Um, and, we're, and yeah, we're super excited. I, I'm happy to take a few questions from the audience. I just see that there's someone that's requested to talk. If anyone has uh, a question from the audience, I'm more than happy to take a few questions. Yeah, let's see if we have some questions. Uh, Julian, have... Julian definitely was got his hand up. Yeah, we have. Uh, Julian already had his question in here. Uh, I can read it. Uh, how does the Y Finance aim to address the issue of privacy and security in online transactions? And what is the process of becoming a validator on the Y Finance platform? Mm-hmm. So <laughs> the way that we're managing the transaction safety, uh, so first of all, of course, there's the advantage of the Cardano blockchain. So transactions are, you know, safer. Liquidity is safer from a mathematical perspective there. Uh, then, of course, in terms of our inbuilt uh, safety nets that we have, I don't really want to be going through them in detail. Uh, they're currently being audited and they will be listed in, I'm certain, in our report. Um, in, in general, the approach that the approach that we've taken is we want to ensure that there is a spread between multiple wallets of the validations on any transactions that are being that are taking place. Um, I don't want to go into the complexities of how the EUTXO model is integrated into uh, DEXs, and that's a very boring conversation. Um, but well, it's probably <laughs> not a boring conversation. Fun. Wrong words. <laughs> That's a complex conversation. It's a complex conversation. Um, But we will certainly be opening up um, validators to the public over the next quarter as we just ensure that all of the systems that we have running are all working within parameters that we're confident. Not that that's the wrong word. That's the wrong word. That the entire system is running without any issue um, from a use from a uh transaction perspective in other words we're not getting clogs in our transaction pipeline before we start letting others manage that transaction process right um and that'll just take us a little bit of fine tuning to ensure that you know everything is open but yeah i'd say that we'll be open to accept validators from the public sort of in the next uh three months 
Yeah. And I guess it's the core answer to that. I see, we, we have company now from Jeremy. Hello, Jeremy. How are you today? You, you must unmute yourself. Thank you. I'm doing well. I uh, just wanted to add that it's 1 a.m. for me. So I feel the pain. <laughs> okay. Are you in New Zealand? I'm in, I'm in Taiwan. Taiwan. Yeah. Wrong way. Yeah, it's New not... Zealand's 5 a.m. <laughs> Beautiful place. Are you in um, Taipei? Yeah. I've been Gorgeous. here. Nice. Very jealous. For uh, 13 years now. But um, the one thing I did want to comment on, on Wi-Fi for the community that's here uh, is, you know, they are a very big innovator on Cardano, and that's very true. And, you know, that's, that's one thing to always look for when you're evaluating projects is what is the, the level of on-chain ex ex experience that this company has? And it's not just on Cardano, but the team also has uh, a good background with, with using Ethereum and, and knowing the, the Ethereum community. Uh, and so when you're building on a, a different blockchain, you never know exactly what it is that's going to create that sticky user base. So with, with Ethereum DeFi, uh, nobody knew that governance tokens was going to be the magic lever that was going to increase the, the number of participants. And I'm not sure what the magic feature will be for Wi-Fi, but I'm, I'm sure that there will be many more features as they continue to grow. Thank you so much, Jeremy. That's very kind words. And I'm hoping that that feature will be our non-custodial liquidity pool mining, um, or it'll be the layer two liquidity pool farming that we're offering, or it'll be the capacity to use your liquidity pool tokens as collateral to take out loans across different uh, lenders on Cardano. That is something that we will be... Oh, God, that was just some alpha that I'm not supposed to release. Um, oh, sorry. nice. I like that. <laughs> Can we release uh, that again? Uh, no, you can listen to the recording. <laughs> that, one's, that one's a bit of a that one's a bit of a big one, actually. Um, but ex exactly, I, as long as my entire philosophy is in, and I guess I said it earlier, right? Continuously drive innovation. Use the technology that Cardano provides us to reimagine the way in which DeFi is being used, and by implementing it in a uniquely Cardano way. We, and I think our decks will show this, uh, we are able to build tools that are more advanced and easier for users to engage, right? You go from a three-step process to farm down to a one-step process to farm. And not only have you reduced that process, but now the liquidity pool tokens become available value in your wallet that you can use to create internal, and I was talking about this earlier, Mary, the internal hedging structures, you can use our decks to actually construct internal hedging structures for your liquidity pool tokens using our layer two liquidity pools, right? So that means you're holding in permanent risk, but you can actually gain more farm and let users purchase those liquidity pool tokens directly from swaps by implementing a tool that reduces your net and permanent risk on your portfolio, right? All of a sudden, we not only have a simpler process for new users, but we have a tool that allows advanced users to simultaneously manage their impermanent risk and access higher farm while doing so. And this is something that Cardano's design and Cardano's technology has allowed us to implement that no other blockchain can. And because we can rethink DeFi within the context of what Cardano is and how Cardano is designed, we can, and you know, I'm not going to say we're the only innovators because we're certainly not. There's many innovators on chain. Uh, we can completely reimagine and re-simplify the DeFi landscape. And I honestly believe that, Mary and Jeremy. I think that that is the goal of Cardano. Mm -hmm. NASA is very excited to say something. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, it's uh, I I haven't been trading much on Cardano, or uh, I have a, a euro euro wallet, mm -hmm. and I have some Cardano, but I don't really know where to go. But now I think if you you could like 
talk so uh, clear and good at 2 a.m. I think I need to hang with you around your morning time, but maybe I will be too tired, so maybe not. <laughs> either. So, <laughs> I, live in, I, do live in, I do live in Italy half the time, so half the time okay, we, will be in better, we will be in better time zones. But I do highly recommend jump into Telegram, jump into Telegram, yeah. into our Telegram, jump into any into our Discord. If you do have Cardano and you haven't begun engaging with the Cardano ecosystem yet, we're more than happy to help you begin engaging. And, um, you know, the Cardano ecosystem, the Cardano DeFi in the last three months has grown almost 100%. Wow. Right? Yeah, I want to I wanna keep up. I don't want to be late this time. Mm -hmm. I was so late to, you know, buy B&B. &B <laughs> I was two years yeah, late I, or something. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So Cardano DeFi is, is starting now. Get in mm -hmm. while it's in the ground floor. And take advantage of it while it's growing. Yeah. Well said. I, I want to do that. And why finance is going to be one of the big tools, uh, hopefully, then. I, I the think, Cardano I think that we're going to be, our aim is to be the Cardano DeFi hub, right? We're going, to have, we're going to have our DEXs, our DEX. We're going to have our community staking, which allows projects to set up staking for their communities. We go um, when we've already got you know fifteen projects or so that are doing that. Might be thirteen. I'll call it three in the morning, brain. Um, <laughs> then we are going to have our auto harvester, which allows even which allows brand new users to engage with liquidity on Cardano with a single click of a button, without even necessarily having to find these platforms and understanding the underlying mechanics of those platforms. And we are going to have all of these essentially delivering buyback mechanisms to the Wi-Fi token market, right? Because all of these are feeding back to the bar and continuously buying back Wi-Fi from the market to sustain farming on our decks so that users are continuously incentivized to provide that liquidity rather than just having an inflationary token that doesn't have some natural buyback mechanism built into it. All of this combined creates a DEX which is more sustainable from an economic perspective, has got multiple tools for different user levels, whether you're a complete beginner through to complete advanced that wants to manage hedging, uh, that wants to manage complex hedging of portfolio ratios based on impermanent risks that they're currently holding, um, all the way uh, and bring this all together on one platform that gives you all these tools in a manner that is as easy as it could possibly be. One single transaction to begin engaging with any of these systems. Very interesting. Well, you, I, you got me hooked. Uh, if I were <laughs> you guys in here listening now, I would definitely check this out even more and uh, join their uh, communities on Telegram or wherever you like the best, the most, the most mm -hmm. to be. And, thank you. Uh, yeah, hang out with the guys in Y Finance. Yeah, and, thank you. Please uh, do. And Mary, I also extend sleeping. that invitation to you. Yeah, they are sleeping down under when when we are awake up here. But I mean, yeah, we'll find some times where we both are well, awake. Like now, we've got we've got the American team members as well, so they're they're also around okay. to <laughs> to assist. Oh, they um, have good times on the others on the other side. And <laughs> no. the other thing is, you're assuming I sleep. That's a very okay. strong assumption to make. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Good, Stephen. Good to know. So, yeah, I will come and hang, hang out with you guys in, in Y Finance Telegram. That's for sure. Thank you. Um, and uh, and yeah. definitely check us out. Like, thank you so much for having us on, Mary. This has really been a pleasure. Um, and thank you so much for coming up and saying hello, Jeremy. Uh, it really means a lot to see you here. Yeah, it was good to have you on again, Jeremy. Glad to be here. And thank you for having us. See you again. Yeah. Yeah, it was a great one. I really enjoyed it too. And uh, I have my last questions, and that is what do you like on your pizza, Stephen? Uh, I'm Italian. Oh, do you like pineapple I'm, then? No, absolutely not. Um, <laughs> so my friends, my friends in Italy have a joke about me. Um, 
they say mani solo l'ingrediente di una capricciosa. So that basically means I either only eat a capricciosa pizza or the ingredients on top of a capricciosa. <laughs> so my entire diet consists of mushroom, ham, cheese, tomato, and olives. And bread. And bread, right? <laughs> sometimes I put them on top of the pizza. Sometimes I have them separated with some rabbit food. So I add some lettuce to it. But that is essentially my core diet. <laughs> No spaghetti. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't eat too much spaghetti. It's a little bit too much carbs. I'm trying. I, I, I live a fairly Mediterranean diet. So my favorite pizza is a capricciosa by far. Okay, okay. Fair enough. <laughs> What about you, Jeremy? Did I ask you when you were up? I don't remember if I asked you. I also say no to pineapple. Oh, okay, okay. No pineapple it is then. Yesterday I had a pizza with mango on it for the first time. That was pretty... I, I I don't know how I feel about I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> <laughs> I would have been fairly emotional. I'll tell you what. <laughs> It was lots of other things as well, but yeah. <laughs> um, just it. quickly, Mary, what's yeah. your favorite pizza? I think uh, there's. Um, I like with lots of onion, <laughs> different onions on them, <laughs> and yeah. Onions are great. Bianco. Um, pizza Bianco is good. Pizza Bianco? Yeah. White pizza, no tomato base. Yeah. Mm. I also love another very traditional Italian pizza that I love is the deep fried pizza. Most people don't realize it's traditional. It comes from just outside Naples. And it's where they take the entire pizza base and they deep fry the entire pizza base. So it becomes really fluffy. Um, and then you put the toppings on top of the deep fried pizza base. Highly recommend if you ever get the chance to have one. Is that like you buy in the store the deep fried pizzas? But then uh, yeah, so you yeah you you do you buy it at a, you know you generally buy it at a restaurant. They don't really do it in street stalls. Um, they probably do actually. I just haven't been to Naples in ten years just, or so, you so could I can't just tell you. Buy them anywhere in in the store, but that's different. I think it's deep fried. Yeah, you need it's it's a specific type of dough that they, they also make the dough slightly differently, so it's like optimized for deep frying and becomes super fluffy while it fries. Uh -huh. um, so you can only buy them in Naples, you said? Well, I don't know if you can only buy them in Naples, but they come That's from right. Naples. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, so I live near Venice, and I've certainly eaten some around Venice. Okay, cool. Good to know. I'll go there someday. I will always recommend going to Italy. I should... <laughs> It's a fantastic I've only place. I've been to Sardegna in Italy, actually. You're the, not, even, not even the Italians have been to Sardegna. What are you doing? <laughs> I know. It was really cold. <laughs> Did you go to Cagliari? Like where? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was the coldest week that year, and it was in March. The people said, "You're you're coming the wrong week. <laughs> All other weeks are so warm. <laughs> the worst week ever we had, or something." Mm -hmm. That's when I was there. So yeah, I need to go again. And I think. Always, anyway. always recommend going to Italy. It's a beautiful place. Um, I'll send anyway, you to bed now, Stephen. Last bit, last time. I just want to repeat: follow us on our.